From Advisory Board, we are bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. One of our most popular episodes, and frankly, one of the ones that we're the most proud of, is an episode we did on why racism is a healthcare issue. We released that episode in the wake of George Floyd's murder, and while we've continued to focus on topics like health equity, we wanted to bring the topic of racism in healthcare back into the spotlight. Yes, we focused on care delivery, but today I want us to look internally, not just on how we treat patients, but on how we recruit, train, and create growth opportunities for our own staff. To have that conversation, I've brought back Michelle Simmons, head of our workforce research team here at Advisory Board. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Ray. It's been a while since we last spoke. I think you moved into a new house. Is that right? I did move into a new house. I bought a house in D.C. I've been living in Virginia ever since I've moved into the DMV. Now I'm a D.C. resident in Ward 7. We flipped. Yes, we, we flipped. We, we flipped. I had been in D.C., actually close to where you live now. And, yes. And, and when, when we just bought a house at the beginning of beginning of quarantine, I, I became a Virginia resident. So I'm not going to say I'm jealous that you're in the district. I am very happy with my new neighborhood, but that is that is very cool. I know you've been repping uh, Del Rey hard on social media. I stand for it. <laughs> That's right. Let's actually ground ourselves in why this is a problem, why leaders should care about workforce diversity or maybe lack thereof. I'm not sure that all of our listeners understand why this is a problem that they should care about, especially among all of the other fires that they might need to be putting out right now. So tell me, why should executives be putting in the work to create a more diverse workforce? Right. I think there are so many reasons to point out for this. So First, there's a lot of data out there. I think since we've been having more and more conversation about diversity and inclusion, everyone is publishing or putting out those reports saying diversity certainly does increase innovation on teams. That makes a lot of sense logically because you're bringing in fresh perspectives and you need fresh perspectives to solve Mm -hmm. some of the problems in healthcare today. I can't imagine that you can get where you need to go toward the future when we know how much things do need to change without injecting um, some fresh perspective at the table, especially in senior leadership where people are making key decisions. And this is a challenge because if we look at most of the workforce in healthcare, and certainly if we look at leadership teams, they tend to be very white yes, and very male. True. So let's talk about how to actually solve this problem. And it strikes me as one that's pretty hard. So when it comes to enabling diversity, where should organizations actually start? You know, I would recommend thinking about succession management first. And the reason being because, you know, we just collected some data for healthcare organizations specifically looking at representation of people of color at different levels in the organization. And we saw at the front line, it's one in three. For management, it's 15%. So it drops to half. And then for your senior leaders, which combines executives and directors, it's 10%. Hmm. I question, you know, what, what message does that send to staff at the front line when we see there's 30% of us here, but only 10% of us at the senior leadership levels? I don't want to personally believe that that means that people like me aren't qualified or able to be leaders of this organization. So it's very clear to me that one of the focus areas should be at the senior leadership level. And I, I would definitely say that it's tough, but important for us to proactively think about what are our key positions and who are we grooming for those roles and making sure that we're preparing people intentionally and that that slate of successors is actually diverse. Because I think we have a better shot than of actually seeing diversity increase in those leadership roles versus if I think, which is a common approach, like when that position opens up, we're scrambling to fill mm-hmm. it and we can't be as intentional with how we're, how we're filling those positions. So that's really interesting data because it says to me, and I don't want to make light of this challenge, but it says to me that at the front lines, diversity is not as big of a challenge and it gets much worse the higher that you go up. Does that come down to not planning for secession or are we actually just pushing 
people of color, diverse groups of people out of our industries. That brings up many points. So one, I would say, because we're collecting data from members and trying to make it easier on them, we don't have the data for specific roles. So I do think that that number is going to hide some things. Like when we're looking at the front line, what positions are we talking about? Because as I talk to members, and I think we would know this to be true, there's a lot of roles that people of color might be in that might be more very entry-level roles that don't really have a career path in the Mm. organization. And so would encourage any organization look at the data to see are we actually do we actually have diversity within and I'm talking about people of color um, because it's it's on the topic of racial diversity but in key roles like are we looking at our clinical positions and, and places where I can actually build a career so that's number one and then number two totally agree that we can also be leaking talent? Is this a place that people of color want to work and are we holding on to that talent? Some organizations are starting to do that diagnostic work again to see, are there disparities here? A colleague on my team found some data from the UK about people of color and that they were disciplined at nearly twice the rate of the overall workforce, which is pretty problematic. Did they have any sense of why that was happening? I think they're just starting to dig into it, but one, I don't think they knew. So Hmm. for a lot of organizations, it's, have I even cut the data that way to uncover that kind of trend? And then secondly, bias. I mean, one, you have to ask questions about the process itself. What does a disciplinary action process look like? And are there moments where bias can be injected into that process, but then also looking at individuals, so leaders, and are we aware of how our bias might be impacting how we look at someone's behavior at work and whether or not we see that as a problem that needs to be fixed or not. I think in a lot of cases, we give some people the benefit of the doubt where others we don't. And I think you're actually going to be coming on our podcast next week to talk about addressing bias within leadership that gets at this exact topic. So aside from maybe actively pushing someone out or overtly disciplining, I'm also aware of the fact that we might just not be creating an environment that a diverse group of people actually wants to work for. And I think that's really hard for white leaders to put themselves in someone else's shoes and understand what it's like to actually be Mm -hmm. underrepresented in their own company. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend leaders address something like that? I'm going to keep going back to data. So the, the first would be for your engagement surveys, are you cutting that data so that you can see, are there any disparities in how people of color in your organization answer questions about whether or not they have the ability to grow within your organization, whether or not they feel like input is valued here. So that's one thing. I also think employee resource groups, to the extent that you have those, can be a great source of feedback to the organization about what the experience is like for people of color and what some of the challenges are. I think there's also a lot that can be done about truly putting yourselves in the shoes of what it would be like to be maybe that one third of folks that is a junior member of the team who's looking for opportunities to grow, looking upward, and maybe not seeing somebody that looks like themselves. Are there kind of easy things that we can do to enable a path like that? Yes. I think mentorship sponsorship are are critical here. And I think I would lean more on sponsorship than mentorship to say the sponsorship is really about advocating for someone in their career, especially in talent calibration conversations. So it's not just providing someone with advice, but being an advocate for them and actually trying to help them get to that next step. A lot of times it's easy for us to reach out to someone who looks like us to offer them informal mentorship or sponsorship if we may not have a formal program in place at our organization. But that does mean that often people of color might get left out of that. You may be the only person of color in your part of the organization and you Mm -hmm. don't necessarily feel empowered to just reach out to that VP and get some career support. 
So I would say, how can we make sure that we're proactively offering that? And are there leaders in our organization that we can say, like, we really need you to invest in leaders of color here. And let's talk about how we might do that rather than leaving it up to employees to figure Mm -hmm. that out. We've been talking so far about how to work with your own people, both in terms of succession management and in terms of retention. But I want to pivot to actually talking about hiring, how to Mm. actually get more of a diverse workforce at the front end. How do you recommend organizations go about having diverse hiring practices? Look at all the places where bias can enter in in hiring, and there are so many. Hmm. First, is our interviewing process even standardized? So in a lot of cases, and sometimes we're guilty of this too, you really leave it up to hiring managers to decide what the rubric is or how they want to define whether a candidate is a good fit for the role or not. Too often we're relying on gut decisions rather than having standard ways that we're evaluating for a specific role or for a job family. Yeah, actually, I want to look this up really quick because we just did a a case study on Mercy Health that did a lot of work standardizing their own assessments, um, deciding what are the competencies that we need to assess, what are the rubrics we need to use for managers, and put a lot of rigor behind that. And they they saw some good results. I think, first, we always talk about reducing first-year turnover as being Mm -hmm. a key workforce metric, so they were able to see a reduction there, which is certainly a positive benefit. The other thing that I would call out from their results is they did see a almost seven percentage point increase in their non-white workforce makeup, which I think is also notable Mm -hmm. in a 20 percentage point increase in non-white hires. And this all came from standardizing the interview process. From standardizing the interview process. Is there a world where standardization can go too far? I'm thinking about the organizations that say we we go to a set number of colleges or we recruit from a set number of medical schools, right? Is there a world where that's too much? Standardize the interview criteria and what you're using to evaluate candidates so that you can make sure that we're holding the same bar for everyone. Do not standardize you know, where you're going to reach out to candidates. I would hope that year over year, you're continuing to refine your strategy, especially as it pertains to how we bring more people of color into our organization and making connections with new associations, tapping into our, if you have a um, people of color affinity group, tapping into them and having them help you make connections so that you can diversify Mm. the workforce. So yes, I would say standardize with that nuance. And I think that there's, yes, there's always a downside to going too far. And I'm certainly not saying when we're standardizing that you want to be a robot in the interview and all that, that is not, that's certainly not what you want. But you and I have honestly had conversations about how to maximize the interview process. I remember when, when we started interviewing folks at advisory board, I was pretty surprised coming from my place of of privilege at how much simple things can actually create bias in the moment. Can you give me some examples of some red flags that folks should avoid? There's all this in-group, out-group bias, or you, you are naturally going to attach people who might be similar to you, where you have very quick commonalities that you might see on their resume. Maybe you went to the same school or you participate in some of the same professional organizations. You are inherently going to maybe give that candidate a little bit of a leg up. And so you need to be aware of that as you're going into interviews. I think one interesting study that stood out to me too was this one about um, organizations that are on their website committed to diversity and inclusion. And as their recruiters were screening candidates, Black candidates and Asian candidates who whitened their resume, so who changed their name so that it did not give Mm -hmm. away their race or ethnicity, were more likely to get a callback. Their callback rate increased by 11% for Asian candidates and 14% for Black candidates by changing the name on their resume. So I would just ask all interviewers to 
as you're going into interviews, be aware of some of those, some of those things that you wouldn't think that you are doing, especially because so many of us at this point do value um, diversity and inclusion, but it doesn't mean that now all of those biases are going to go away. Do you want to hear mine? There's, there's sort of two that stick out to me. Um, one, which I, I has just ingrained itself in my mind is that the simple question that everybody thinks to ask when they're kind of going to see a candidate and walking them back to your office is to ask, how did you get here? Mm. How is the traffic on the way in? And that that question alone can be biased because you don't know what circumstances somebody had in just arriving to your office or to your physician practice, et cetera. And I want to underscore your point that gut instinct is most likely bias. Saying my gut says this is somebody we want to go with actually probably means your gut instinct says this is somebody like you. Uh We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. Looking for more ways to connect with Ray and our other experts? To stay up to date on the biggest news and issues in healthcare today, follow Advisory Board on social media. There, you'll find resources for your team, our experts' latest blog posts, and information about upcoming special events. On Twitter, we're at AdvisoryBD. And we're on Facebook and LinkedIn, too. Just search for Advisory Board. I can imagine that in theory, folks agree with a lot of this, especially when it comes to hiring practices. But there are some actual policies here that are going to get pushback, like the idea that if a position is open, we're not actually going to move forward unless we've met our diversity standards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, that reminds me a lot of something that I think just a couple of weeks ago, the Oscars announced. Did you see these new diversity rules? Oh, yeah. Remind me about it. I won't go into detail, but there are arguments on both sides. Folks say that it is wildly overdue, and some are saying it's not enough. But there's four potential paths that films can take when it comes to meeting diversity standards. And they have to get two out of four of them. Some of them are external, like actually having lead actors and actresses come from different groups. Some are internal, like looking at who's in behind the scenes of making films. But when I saw the announcement, there was pretty big pushback on both sides. Yeah, I can totally see that. I mean, people don't want to feel like they are having to do something that they're forced to change the way that they approach the, the job. They've been doing things in their own way for a long time. I think about the differences that we see because my team also serves some international organizations in Australia and Canada. And in Australia, there are government mandates around hiring particularly Aboriginal people into roles and that if there is Hmm. a Aboriginal candidate who's qualified, you have to hire them. And on the one hand, that can be great for putting some incentives in place and actually putting teeth behind a goal. On the other hand, can you imagine being that person and people thinking like, oh, this is, I mean, in in the U.S. we call that like you're an affirmative action hire. Like you just got here because you are Aboriginal or in my case, you just got into Yale because you're black and because they have to have this quota and how disparaging that can be, how demotivating that can be for people. So I feel like there is a balance um, and you do want people as you're putting some these types of rules in place to feel like they had a say or that there was a conversation about mm-hmm. how we do this together, but you don't wait either because it's always going to be the detractors. So if we right. value this, yeah. you know, we have to move forward and this is a new standard. And I think you brought up kind of the crux of the argument that the Oscars was facing. You know, are we setting a different standard just for the sake of diversity? And how can you do that in the artistic endeavor that is getting to film production? But that's a pushback that I have to imagine folks are thinking about as they listen to this episode. Also, before you answer, I I find the need to point out to our listeners that the main beneficiary of affirmative action has been white women. And I'm raising my hand as I say that. But how do you, back to my actual point, how do you respond to the pushback? Are we setting a different 
bar just for the sake of diversity? You know, I would ask a question back of what is the bar that we have set at all? Is there even a bar to begin with? Because in a lot of cases, many organizations do not have a standard way that they're evaluating people. So that's one. And then secondly, is the bar that we've set serving us well as an organization for different key positions? And do we need to revisit that? Because I don't think that we are lowering the bar. I think we're actually expanding what we're looking for and like what that might look like. And there's a lot of things that we have to call into question about what is the bar? I like your your idea of asking a question back. I think mine might be, is doing things like taking a longer time, seeing a diverse set of candidates first, actually lowering a bar? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. No, I think it's being thoughtful about who you want to hire. And often we put ourselves into positions where we force ourselves to believe we have to make these decisions quickly. But we know, especially when you hire externally, that a lot of people might fail when they come into the organization just because of how hard it is. So you really do want to take your time and make sure that you are making the right decision. I really like this idea of culture add versus culture fit for the organization. Hmm, What does that mean? We talk a lot about culture fit and I worry about, especially in homogenous organizations, what does that mean? Does that just mean more of the same versus us being able to say who is going to add to our culture in new and exciting ways and offering a fresh perspective? So how do we How do we add more dimension to who we are rather than adding more of the same note (laughs) to the company? You know, I think a lot of folks have been reflecting on the life and legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg Mm. since her death. Yeah. And what comes to mind from what we're talking about now is her infamous quote when asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court bench? She says, without a beat, when there are nine. I love that. And I think about that a lot because nobody would ask about, are we setting a different bar for the sake of diversity for a group of white men? Mm. And I would just push back and maybe say, you know, when there are nine, you wouldn't be asking this about any other group of people. I love that. I want to keep going down this theme of common areas of pushback. I think that's actually something that can be helpful to arm our audience with. Mm -hmm. We talked about one. But what's some other common pushback that you are hearing? Well, when we think about leadership roles, I think there's a perception that, well, they don't open up that often the organization. People in healthcare have pretty long tenures, stay at the organization for a while. So we may have to wait for a long time before a position opens up. I think there, there's certainly some validity to that, but I also would encourage people to get creative because I think that line of thinking is one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of movement in terms of diversifying the organization. So what are what are ways that we can work around that? Didn't Serena Williams' husband just do that? I can't oh, well, his yeah, name. you could just step down. <laughs> <laughs> the radical the radical answer would be, well, let's let's have like 25% of these people leave and bring in some new folks into the organization, but you know, that's radical. I'm not sure that that's an advisory board best practice, but it it brings up the question of, you know, we don't have enough movement. Are we just supposed to fire someone? Are we just supposed to ask somebody to step down? I mean, what realistically can organizations do there? At the very least, grooming people for roles. You don't know what's going to happen. And I think there's certainly higher levels of leader burnout right now. And so some people may need to step away. Some people may need a break. But if we're not thinking ahead about preparing people for those at-risk roles that might be key positions and we don't have a chance of potentially bringing someone in who is a person of color. So that might be just one thing to start thinking about. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to your earlier point about the essential role of secession management and Mm -hmm. where I think your retention strategy can actually be your best recruitment strategy. Yes, yes, totally. Nishali, you're out there having conversations with HR leaders and executive teams about this exact topic. What do you do when someone tells you, you know, I think I actually have this problem solved? Or maybe they say, you know, we're not perfect, but that's okay because we're better than most. What do you say to them? 
One, I would definitely want to know where, when we're talking about diversity, what are we talking about? So if we look at the racial and ethnic makeup in our organization, where are people? So you may say, oh, 40% of our front line are people of color. Awesome. What roles are they in? How many Mm -hmm. of them are in clinical roles or patient-facing roles? How many people are at our manager, director, executive level on our board? Hmm. You know, those are important questions to ask. And the, the other thing is just because we do have some level of diversity in the organization also doesn't mean that it's inclusive. One doesn't mean the other. You have to do some work in creating a space that is psychologically safe, that where people who are bringing different perspectives actually feel like they can bring those to bear. And that does take some work. I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking about such an important topic. I know we're going to be having you back to continue some conversations along these lines. But before I let you go, I want to ask the final question that I ask on every episode. You, you probably remember this from the last time. What should the leaders listening to this podcast be focusing on right now? To me, I think going back and making a clear commitment about what does a racially diverse organization look like for us, for where we're located and committing to increasing at certain levels in your organization and communicating that to your staff. It's interesting to me, people have been talking about this for a long time, but I ask what sacrifices have been made to actually increase diversity, particularly racial and ethnic diversity in your organization, because I'm not, I'm not convinced. Like we've been talking about this, but has it really been a priority for you? And what does it look like to make this a true priority versus a it's something on the agenda, but it's frankly always at the bottom of the list. I love that. Thanks so much for coming on Radio Advisory, Bichelet. Thanks for having me. Organizations have been talking about creating a diverse workforce for some time. If I'm honest, I mostly hear folks talk about it in terms of women in leadership programs or maybe being proud of one or two new faces on their executive teams. But we can't stop there. Thinking about all aspects of diversity actually means continuing to push our efforts by investing in racial and ethnic diversity. If you want to do that in a real way, remember, we're here to help. Jumble your words, say, how the hell do I want to answer this? Ray, that was a stupid question. All of that is fair game. All of that will get cut out. Right. I don't know. Ray, that's a stupid, stupid question. question. That's coming in strong. Right. <laughs> it's like a hot take coming after that. I don't know. That could be- Only Chile can say that to me. <laughs>